Hi, my name is Michelle Wong, and I'm a researcher at Asia at Archive. Uh, welcome to the uh, the panel for the Mahasa program that uh, we're doing at uh, Takaat Summit. Um, tonight's panel um, is titled Collectives from the 1950s to the Present. Uh, this topic of artist collective is um, a very exciting one and one that many of us still find pertinent today through both historical case studies as well as practices uh, present today. And inside Takaat Summit, we see the entire first floor dedicated to um, the artist collectives as well. Oops, my phone has gone off. Um, as we start, I'd just like to put uh, forward uh, a metaphor so that we can just retain this image in our minds as we go on. Um, that artist collectives are like low-lying low islands and archipelagos. Uh, they rise and they fall both physically and conceptually as different kinds of allegiances and urgencies consolidate in response to changing conditions of an art ecology. Uh, so we'll have uh, three speak uh, four speakers today. There's a slight change uh, in uh, the uh, one of the speakers. So instead of Mustafa Zaman, we have uh, Dali Amamun with us, who's actually part of the Shamoy group, and will speak to us about that. Uh, we also have um, Dana Linegren, uh, who will speak to us about uh, artist collectives in present Dhaka, and Samina Iqbal, who will speak to us about Lahore Art Circle in the 1950s and Melissa Carlson, who will speak to us about uh, a group of Kashmiri artists who came together in 2018, Kochi um, Biennale. Uh, and before I read out the bios of our speakers, and I'll introduce everyone sort of before they come on stage, and so they'll do their presentations, and then we'll all have a conversation on stage, and then I'll open it up uh, for question and answers. Um, I'd just like to sort of read a series of questions uh, surrounding art collectives posed by the New Delhi-based uh, Rux Media Collective, and I'll just read from that. Uh, what does it mean for an artistic community to keep searching for a definition of itself? Is art making in a contemporary context all about form? Is it about the insertion and the assertion of the social, the ecological, and the political? Uh, is it about identity? Or is it about the dissolution of identity? Is it about forging alliances in the region? Is it about focusing on the life of a city? Is it about new kinds of exhibition making or about new kinds of aesthetic sensibility? Is it about enlarging the ambit of what can be called art? Or is it about evolving far more discriminatory and rigorous aesthetic criteria for naming something as art? Is it about the concern of a new generation, or is it about creating a space for dialogue between generations? And finally, is it about the ability of art practitioners to step outside of the limitations of what is commonly understood as constitutive of the predicament of being visual artists, and learning instead to be in dialogue with other practitioners, such as scientists, architects, filmmakers, software programmers, sound artists and musicians? Is it even about artists learning to be, at a more general level, cultural organizers, archivists, public intellectuals, and lively interlocutors in the life of their cities and their world? Um, and so we'll actually begin with Samina, and I'll just uh, introduce Samina as well. Uh, Samina Iqbal is a practicing artist, an art historian, and an academic. Uh, she received her PhD in Art Historical Studies from the Virginia Commonwealth University, and her interest is, uh, research interest is in modern and contemporary art of South Asia, and in particular, her research focuses on an empirical study of the specific conditions that gave rise to modern art in Pakistan in its formative years, and analyzes how a small group of artists by the name of Lahore Art Circle engaged in a counter-movement outside of the nationalist agendas of Pakistan's after 1947. Over to you, Samina. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming for this evening. I would like to thank Getty Foundation, Dhaka Art Summit, Cornell University, and Asia Art Archive for providing me with the opportunity to share my research at this platform. In my today's presentation um, on collectives of 1960s to the present, I'm going to push back a little and talk about the artist collective Lahore Art Circle, founded in 1952 in Lahore, which was West Pakistan at that time, which then advances to become Pakistan Group of London in 1958 in London. 
Um, and thank you, Michelle, for such a great opening. Um, and so the presentation, in many ways, uh, address all of the things that you have talked about, especially in the context of uh, Rux Media Collection. Since my audience here today are familiar with the history of this region, so I'm not going to spend very much time on the historical context of the region, but very briefly, the historical partition of, I feel like I need to give a little bit of the context um, of the historical partition of the Indian subcontinent on August 14, 1947, ended nearly two centuries of colonial rule and divided the region into two separate nations, India and Pakistan. And of course, Pakistan comprised of East Pakistan and West Pakistan, resulting in massive historical migration, causing vast displacement and massacre across the borders, which profoundly affected people on both sides of the border. Under these circumstances, the first decade of Pakistani history, 1947 to 57, I'm particularly referring to, was traumatic. Every aspect of life in the new established society was in a state of flux. Among the millions of migrants were many visual artists who also migrated from India to Pakistan, mostly in big cities, including Lahore and Karachi. And thinking, most of them were thinking that, you know, when, once the things calm down, they will return to India. Since my focus for this presentation is Lahore Art Circle, therefore I would like to focus and uh, uh, give you a glimpse of the art scene of Lahore in the first decade of Pakistan's establishment. So after the partition of Pakistan, um, of uh, Indi Indian subcontinent and Pakistan comes into being, uh, Lahore inherited like, you know, the uh, only art institute, which was the colonial project, um, Mio School of Art, design, uh, of art and design established in 1872. Across from the road from Mio School is the art department of the University of Punjab still today, founded in 1882 by the British Raj and the British born artist Anna Molka was the head of the department before and after the partition. Uh, since I wouldn't have very much time to discuss um, each and every artist, but I just want to give you a very um, a visual uh, a representation of what's going on in Lahore. So Abdurrahman Chukhtai, an established senior artist from colonial India, from Lahore, dominated the art scene of Pakistan. His art practices embraced the revival of Mughal miniature aesthetics in an ornamental decorative style. Besides him, there were also other artists, so I'm just kind of giving you a glimpse of the kind of works and prevalent practices in Pakistan at that time, and especially in Lahore. So Fazi Rahmin is just the exception because he was in Karachi. So a major shift happens in 1951 when, when Shakir Ali, um, a native of Rampur, India, studying in Europe, decides to become a Pakistan, Pakistani citizen and move to Pakistan. So just a reminder, when Pakistan was established, um, Shakir Ali was studying in Czech Republic at that time. So this was like his very conscious decision at the age of 31 to come back to Pakistan and adopt Pakistan as the country of his origin then. Shakir joined Mio School of Arts uh, Lahore in 1952 as a faculty and spent his afternoons and evenings at the Park Tea House and the Coffee House, both across from each other, located at the Mal Road Lahore. So just giving you a glimpse of this place. Um, um, it would be worth mentioning here that the two cafes were the hotspots of intellectual discourse among the intelligentsia of Lahore. Debatably, Shakir really, being the only artist who was well versed in the in traditional Indian miniature painting, as well as European art education, at once became the center of attraction for the younger artists in Lahore. And along with the five other young artists, including Sheikh Safdar Ali, Sayyid Ali Imam, Muin Najmi, Ahmed Parvez, and Anwar Jalal Shamza, they founded the Lahore Art Circle. There were two other women artists, Razia Feroz and Maryam Shah, who also joined the circle immediately. It is important here that I mention that four of the six artists, including Shakir Ali, Ali Imam, Anwar Jalal Shamza, Sheikh Safdar Ali, migrated from various parts of India to Lahore. Muin Najmi and Ahmed Parvez were the only one who were already based in Lahore. The arrival of Shakir Ali in Lahore was a fresh breath in the art circle. It was a significant new beginning for the visual arts of Pakistan. It was a time when the young artists were struggling to find a new direction in their work, given that they were fully conscious of their new beginning in a new nation state and wanted to make a mark that was different what they inherited. Following Shakir's trajectory, the work of these artists drastically changed. 
I will come back to it in a minute, but I would like to quote Safdar Mir, professor of English literature at Government College Lahore, who brilliantly captures the paradigm shift in the works of these artists, and he states, I quote, Shakir joined the Mayo School of Art, and what is more important, came across a group of very young and very violent enthusiasts of painting. These young painters had similar problems and a similar attitude towards their solutions. They're all iconoclasts, individualists, and breakers of traditions, mad. They were young. They believed in doing whatever they pleased. New experiences and an expanded scope had come their way. A new nation was trying to forge itself into unity to face the challenges of freedom. The goal of this presentation, while I'm discussing the conditions and effects of the founding of Lohar Art Circle, is also to understand why artist collectives or groups are formed. The question to consider address the need, importance, and implications of forming an art circle. What purpose does it serve? What is its impact, especially in reference to a newly established post-colonial society? Does this give the work of art more validity or credibility if produced by a large number of individuals forming a group or a school or establishes a movement? To begin to address or address these questions, it is useful to look at art historian Michael Ledger's analysis of the New York School and the way he defines collectivity and group identity in his book, The Formation of an Avant-Garde in, in New York, um, since it provides insight into how another group of artists like Lahore Art Circle band together to achieve common goals. I quote, different stories of claims have tended to run together in establishing group identity, claims of three general types. First, evidence may be offered to significant social context among the artists who are shown to have worked together or met regularly. They may also have knowledge the common, uh, uh, common aesthetic commitment and beliefs and have striven to exhibit together. A second alternative focus is on similarities of styles or subject matters, similarities not necessarily recognized by the artists themselves. Third, Ideological congruencies may be the grounds of a perceived unis unity, even if those congruencies are largely a matter of what the artist agreed on opposing, an academic, for instance, or a prevailing set of beliefs and theories. The conditions that Ledger lays, lays out for the New York School may very well be applied to the Lohar Art Circle because Ledger's definition of what can constitute a group matches a number of the social conditions and the ideological concerns of Lohar Art Circle. The members of Lohar Art Circle met regularly and they shared common beliefs in various issues of aesthetics, as well as the need to explore the medium of painting to invent a new idiom. They, they agreed on breaking away from most of the previous trends in Pakistani art, including shifting from naturalistic, idealized, and romanticized painting approaches, not only in terms of their media, but also in subject matter. During an exciting time of social and political chaos, these young artists felt the need to create a platform for the exchange of ideas and knowledge that would encourage critical thinking, debate, and discussions on various matters of art and politics. The group provided a support system of assurance to each other in a time when there was a scarcity of exhibition venues, galleries, viewers, and constructive criticism. I would also argue, because Sh uh, Sh Sheikh Safdar Ali, one of the members of the Lahore Art Circle, um, was um, in pre-partition India, part of the Muslim Art Sketch Club, um, for which MF Hussain was also a part. Um, he must be the one who also have reminded the fellow artists the importance and great benefits of forming a group. Um, also, not to um, ignore the fact that one of the other members, um, Sayyid Ali Imam, was the brother of Sayyid Haider Raza, who was the part of uh, Bombay Progressives group. Lahore Art Circle didn't adapt to a specific modern movement, nor did they all practice a specific style as a group. Instead, each one of them established their own unique style. So giving you a glimpse of what their practices were um, from the colonial times, like from the, uh, before the partition, uh, before forming the Lahore Art Circle, um, and then I'm going to show you the switch that happens in their work. So this is the work, so in the you know, interest of time, I just put everything together on one slide. So if you can, I mean, you can obviously see that, you know, uh, this, sh this shift, this is a really drastic one from what they were practicing before, because most of them are either practiced in like, you know, European academic style or like, you know, uh, Mughal miniature paintings. So, 
I here argue that this shift or deviation of the collective from their early learning was an effort to decolonize the colonial artistic practices. What is obvious in these comparison is uh, this, the strive of Lohar Art Circle to find a new vocabulary and establish themselves as citizens of the new state, trying to shed away the old colonial skill. Lohar Art Circle did not hold on to a neat order. They, that would guide and define the fashion that its adherents were following in terms of subject matter, style, and technique. I emphasize here that the continuous shift between their still life, figurative, and landscape painting, which they were making while uh, practicing uh, their uh, new vocabulary, um, that sometimes altered, alternated between realistic, abstract, and semi-abstract subjects uh, represents what I call as heuristic modernism by which I'm referring to their continuous experimentation, evolution, and the evolution of the work. Although the members of Lohar Art Circle developed and worked in diverse styles, there were a number of underlying goals common between them. The artists develop a productive dialogue through their work. If one artist presented an idea of exploring a certain subject matter, the rest would reflect upon it um, in individual ways. So the ideas were continuously reflected and refracted between the members, thus developing a discourse on various issues of abstraction, stylization, and aesthetics. By that, uh, what I mean here is, and I've not included the style, so for instance, one of them would take a topic of like, you know, representing anarchy, and each one of them uh, would paint it very differently. So, um, and because of the time constraint, I didn't add that, but this is what I meant that, you know, they would take one topic and, you know, um, represent it in like different ways. So there are four, ex five, uh, four to five exhibitions which are credited to, um, so these are the samples of these artists' work. So there were about like, you know, five exhibitions that uh, Lahar Art Circle did under the banner of um, Lahar Art Circle. Um, so, but none of these were presented like, you know, as of, all the members together, except for the last one that I'm just showing, like 1951. Um, so um, they would present, they would exhibit in the groups of two and threes and sometimes four. Um, and they were sponsored by United States Information Center, Murray. Um, Lohar Art Circle's disposition was towards international modernism. And instead of being attached to any singular Western art movement of modernism, they were looking at various examples of modern art movement in Paris, Munich, London, and New York. They were inspired by the larger modernist language and movements of international abstraction, such as grid-inspired structures, uh, rejection of representation, uh, illusion, representational illusion, use of straight edge shaped, which I kind of showed you the work um, in, um, and there were more of these. So, sorry. So between 1949 to 58, many of the artists from um, South, Southeast Asia and former British colonies traveled to United Kingdom to either study art or because they were frustrated by the lack of the critical and international perspectives in art institutions at home. And many artists moved to London because they simply wanted to be part of the international art world. This included artists like um, M.F. Hussain, um, Souza, um, and they were like Iqbal Jafri and um, Avinash Chandra. Uh, following the same trajectory, three of the six members of Lohar Art Circle um, moved to London, including Shamza, um, Ali Imam, and Ahmed Parvez. Safiuddin Ahmed and uh, Murtaza, so these were the four exhibitions um, that the Lahore Art Circle presented. Um, and they are this, here, is Shamza is in the blue frame, um, Ahmed Parvez is in the orange frame, and here is Sayyid Ali Imam, the three who migrated to London. And here they also met um, uh, Safiuddin Ahmed and Murtaza Bashir, and they again founded a second group, which was called as Pakistan Group London. So the mission of this group was outlined in the brochure of their first exhibition, which was held in the Woodstock Gallery, London, from November 10th to 23rd, 1958. And it states, I quote, the aim of the group is to project Pakistani art and to introduce contemporary Pakistani artists to create and provide opportunities and facilities for contemporary and young Pakistani artists to exhibit their work abroad, end quote. All five artists uh, showed their work in this exhibition, and it was like, I, I, like you can see, Pakistan Group London, so five modern artists, these, this was the title of it. 
The general secretary for the group was uh, Salim Shahid, who was a news broadcaster for BBC London Urdu service, who, was, who previously had served as a secretary general for Lahore Art Circle in Pakistan. After this exhibition, members of Pakistan group London actively collaborated with other artists and held various groups and solo exhibitions in London. The formation of this group further strengthens and clarifies Lahore Art Circle's importance and the germinal power it held. Um, in conclusion, I will posit that the double burden of rejecting the colonial past and yet embracing the nostalgia of the glorious Islamic past of the Mughal period was at the core of nationalist agenda of the newly formed nation state of Pakistan. However, Lahore Art Circle members worked, although produced during the most volatile period of Pakistani history, did not conform to those nationalistic or Islamic agenda of the newly established country. Instead, the hybrid syntax of their works provide a distinctive case study of international modernism and negotiations of localized approaches towards adopting a distinctly modern art outside mainstream Western modernism. Yet, nonetheless, informed by some of its major objectives and developments. Their work can be considered as reflecting a hybrid identity of bridging secular and modern worlds, in fact, the diversity in each member's work signifies the fact that there was not a single approach that could have been the foundation for their group. In retrospect, it appears that they actually teamed up to preclude one foundation, so they were able to create works that would pose questions rather than answer to their practices. Having said this, I also want to argue that these artists very much valued and understood the establishment of Pakistan, and that becomes very obvious when they made the second group um, which was called as Pakistan Group London, um, claiming the Pakistani identity in the name of the group. Thank you. Thank you, Samina. Our next speaker will be Melissa Carlson. Uh, Melissa is a PhD student at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, her recent work has examined how post-colonial censorship regime in Myanmar shaped uh, the development of Burmese uh, modern and contemporary art, but she will actually be speaking about another uh, part of her, uh, research that she's been doing um, about, uh, I'll let, actually let Melissa tell us more about it. In, uh, this is a moment from Kochi uh, 2018, Melissa. So <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, Mahasa and the Samdani family and Diana for having me here today. Uh, I was so excited and honored to be a part of this panel on collectives um, that I actually, I did abandon my usual topic of Burma um, and took it up as a chance to speak about one of the more innovative models, in my opinion, of a collective. Um, the collective that my presentation covers adopts a fluid definition of place, such as appearing in virtual and physical spaces and a changing uh, roster of artists and curators. This free-flowing format creates uh, new avenues to transport outwards a site-specific trauma. In essence, these artists are creating exhibition spaces when it is simply not possible at home. Of course, my remarks today concern the Srinagar Biennale, uh, where I experienced it in Kochi as a node of the 2018 Kochi Maziris Biennale uh, in January 2019. So why am I considering a Biennale as a, uh, as a collective? Like a connect, uh, collective, the Srinagar Biennale has a manifesto. Like a Biennale, it promotes a cohesive identity in the model of a national cultural framing. Yet, it operates in an unofficial capacity. So here, artists are creating a cultural identity beyond the reach of the state, or states in this case, which are preoccupied with territorial concerns. The Srinagar Biennale allows a fractured community to collectively assert a new visual narrative. For these reasons, I'm going to uh, consider it an interesting proposition to treat this Biennale as a collective. And just as a final note, I'll be referring to Srinagar as an ongoing site of conflict between India and Pakistan, even China, which I think we can all agree is, is an apt framing, in particular due to recent events. So 
The founders of the Srinagar Biennale uh, describe it as a rhizomatic biennale, meaning that it surfaces and nodes in many places, attaching itself to other organizations. So this format raises such conceptual questions as what is the impact of a rhizomatic biennale? How does it change in each place that it surfaces? What does it mean to have a biennale about a specific place, yet itself unanchored from that place? For example, a biennale focused on Kashmir that cannot be held in Kashmir. And can a site-specific aspect of a place, let alone a personal trauma, be transported through art? And that's going to be the first focus of my presentation. And then the second one um, relates to sensorial art. And so the outflows and inflows of population is crucial to any research on the Srinagar Biennale, let alone Kashmir. Specifically, Kashmiri artists must negotiate a fractured sense of place through memory, nostalgia, loss, and national belonging in response to population flows and the subsequent ruptures of communities. So state and communal violence resulted in Muslim Kashmiri artists staying in Kashmir and Hindu Kashmiri artists leaving Kashmir. Both populations face shrinking cultural space for their work. But I want to push beyond the idea of evaluating this Biennale's success in Kochi in terms of simply transporting Kashmir to viewers in Kerala. Instead, I'm going to propose that these artists are using sensorial art to reappropriate and correct the image of Kashmir by engaging viewers in a sensorial rather than just a visual experience. And finally, this sensorial experience offered by these artists counters uh, how others have imagined Kashmir, such as India, Pakistan, extremists, militants, independence fighters, tourism boards, Bollywood, etc. So the artists, in essence, are reverse engineering centuries of Kashmiri cultural identity as shaped and idealized through imaginings by others to offer us a vision anchored in their present day realities. So the year 1989 and the surrounding decade mark a pivotal moment in Asia where a seismic authoritarian shift rippled across post-colonial nations and resulted in governments retracting liberties gained immediately following independence, often as a result of economic progress not matching expectations held by either governments or its citizens. And so the year 89 is also pivotal for the artistic community of Kashmir. It's when some of the most important artists of the valley left and when some of the artists who remained faced disappearing cultural space. In fact, 89 marked the start of the most violent decade in Kashmir's history and when Kashmir's Institute of Music and Fine Arts closed, at least temporarily. Art historian Wasim Mushtaq pinpoints 1989 as the moment when Kashmiri artists in exile and at home in Kashmir, quote, infected their aesthetic preoccupations with nostalgic memories. So today, no art galleries exist in Kashmir. And so in 2014, Saeed Mushtaba Rizvi, a painter and a photographer, opened Gallery One, seen here at the Tourist Reception Center in the Valley. The Ministry of Tourism closed it a year later um, after allegedly sending staff to vandalize paintings. So prior to this, the last exhibition space opened in 1960s when a bunch of modernist artists attempted to display work actually at the exact same location. The then prime minister ordered the paintings removed, labeling them as nonsense. So following Rizvi, Rizvi's 2014 unsuccessful attempt to create an art space, he rallied other artists in Kashmir and the diaspora to launch the Srinagar Biennale with the aim of showing the world that, quote, heaven on earth or paradise, both slogans used by tourism, bo tourism boards, in fact is actually paradise lost or the twilight zone. Yet the physical and cultural barriers to exhibitions in Kashmir necessitated a creative framework for the Biennale. As you can see in the manifesto, adapting a rhizomatic format which means that there's uh, multiple starting and ending points without any hierarchies. The Srinagar Biennale assumes the conceptual problematic of a fractured population, a fractured region, by appearing in multiple places as, as interpreted by whichever curator or artist decides to instigate a new node. Therefore, we can only experience the Srinagar Biennale in fragments in much the same manner that most people, or that Kashmir has experienced either through its diaspora communities in India and Pakistan and film and handicrafts and geopolitics. So in terms of format, as I mentioned, it attaches itself to other art exhibitions, programs, or cultural spaces, and it will often add the place name to its own name, such as Srinagar Biennale Kochi. 
I can attest that trying to track or trace the programming, artwork, or artist is near impossible. There's no official website. The Facebook links are expired. Uh, so random photos by attendees of the talks or the performances are the most reliable sources to track these multiplicities. So, but nonetheless, it's active. I've uncovered nodes in Delhi in 2016 and 17, in Basel, Switzerland, and in Bangalore in 2018, in Sweden in 2019, uh, 2018, again in India, and of course in 2018 in Kochi. So, in this regard, it surfaces in liminal, if not virtual, spaces. So here, in the upper right, it, we'll see in uh, April 2017, it surfaced virtually through Anupam Saikia's performance, They Live, We Sleep, Conflicting Space, enacted and filmed in Hora and played via video in a restaurant in Malmo, Sweden, because um, Swedish and Kazmiri artists wanted to, quote, examine living history uh, through performance art cross-culturally transmitted. So in essence, Kashmiri artists transmitted themselves outward to new locations. In the lower left, we have Srinagar Biennale Basel, which was also structured around virtual performance art exchanges between Swiss and Kashmiri artists uh, in March 2018. And audience were able to not only view, but participate in performances that were taking place in both locations. Yet, in the Kochi node, artists had to work from within a foreign environment to carve out a physical space in which to wrest these narratives of Kashmir from the mouths of politicians or tourism boards. So the layout here was particularly um, key to its visual and sensory successes. Now it surfaced in Kerala, 3,500 miles south of Kashmir, uh, in this windowless wing of TKM Warehouse in Madancheri, which was one of the many venues of the Kochi Biennale. Um, and it was quite physically isolated on the, from the main grounds of the Biennale, the main Biennale. So the literary and cultural historian Ananya Jahanara Kabir framed the valley as a territory of desire rather than one of economic value, at least in a psyche of post-colonial India. So in this sense, India yearns for Kashmir, and they want Kashmir to yearn for India, at least in how Bollywood portrays it. But what's less understood is what Kashmiris yearn for. And so, in this sense, experiences cannot always be visually replicated. And here, two artists performed a type of surveillance piece where unsuspecting visitors to the space were frisked upon entry. Veer Munshi, the uh, curator of this Biennale, of the uh, Srinagar Biennale node, titled this space a place of repose. And he anchored the show around a Sufi shrine, or a darga, uh, constructed by Kashmiri artisans. His goal was to create, quote, a space within a space. And all of the exhibiting artist works are exhibiting in and around the shrine. Um, his curatorial ambitions centered on defining the role of the artist in a conflict zone. In particular, how artists can reach the public through their practice. He wanted to own the cultural space of Kashmir by engaging artists who were born in Kashmir, who ran away from it, who were living in it, to protect this secular middle space as, as defined, or um, captured by this Sufi shrine. Now, the presence of the 24 by 16 foot shrine with artwork positioned around it quite overwhelms the room. And it functions um, as this communal space for the artist uh, to try to convey a message. And for Munshi, to create an actual space for people to step into and experience the actual grief of his community. He told me, one foot less and it would look like a model. He said of the space uh, shrine's dimensions. Yet by framing the, sh um, the show around a Sufi shrine, an object that is rapidly disappearing from Kashmir's landscape, um, he's also creating, in essence, a shrine of a shrine. And the site quickly becomes one of mourning for memories, nostalgia, and loss, in particular by his installation inside. At the center of the shrine is his hauntology. Uh, in which you have 14 child-sized coffins, each handcrafted with paper mache uh, on the outside and paper mache bones made by Kashmiri artisans on the inside, and they rest on dirt scattered on the floor. Upon closer inspection, uh, you'll see two empty coffins um, back there. Uh, but one cannot overemphasize the stifling heat, which assaults visitors physically alongside a visual so shock of seeing open caskets alongside beautifully detailed bones. So there's a visual and physical discomfort of beauty alongside death. 
Uh, Veer Munshi said, bones do not speak of any particular community. Soldier cast color, bones speak of pain, both in exile and at home. Therefore, Munshi's hauntology is a convolution of memories of the past and imaginings of the future. So as applied to his or the Kashmiri experience, whether in the diaspora or those who remained, this negotiation of imagining the past, present, and future of a place trapped in a cycle of conflict necessitates a representational mode beyond simply replicating reality. Or, as with our next piece, the installation and of uh, Etisham Azur, that sometimes sensorial art alone is not enough to convey trauma. He created this 2013 installation titled Horrors and Politics of Nostalgia uh, while living in Lahore. The installation consists of 10 sheepskins nailed to a wall in place of where a chalkboard should hang. We see the skins casting outlines of legs and arms and for a brief moment seem to morph between animal and human form. A school chair holds, holds an oxygen mask and is turned to face uh, the wall or the skins where the chalkboard should be. Underneath rests an oxygen cylinder squeezed between the chair legs, seemingly twice its length. And he's included alongside this in the museum label, a poem, which you can read. This installation references memories of Azar's life in Kashmir as a schoolboy. The instability and insecurity that permeated his former life is palpable. The viewer's senses are again activated. The smell of the hides lingers until visitors circulate um, and disperse the odor. Um, and furthermore, as the hides travel, different climates must extract new odor. And in Kochi, it appears to be drying them further. So his installation offers a new framing of life in the va valley beyond heaven on earth. And he's reducing the famed Kashmiri ring shawls or pashminas to the hostile and stable environments in which they are produced. Death is present, and like in Munshi's work, the perpetrator is unnamed. The hides are hanging, removed of life, and ask us what comes next. What is life after such violence? The next piece, Mamun Ahmad's 30 foot, and this is the last piece, uh, painting Rivarda, wraps around another corner of, of the room, opposite uh, around the shrine, giving visitors little choice but to view it in close proximity, almost as a movie reel as they circumambulate ambulate the shrine. We see a tightly bound forest of tangled branches depicted in black and gray, which unfurls across the canvas. Upon closer inspection, the seemingly abundant forest is barren of life. And in fact, the bones of a disembodied skeleton whirl through the thickets, merging at time with the branches or getting caught in the roots. As one moves along the painting, a femur appears a rib cage, a tibia, a spine, or even a lone hand. Oops. In conclusion, well, this painting in particular speaks of a landscape littered with loss, in contrast to the perfectly manicured Kashmir gardens that captivated Mughal rulers. However, the bones in Ahmad's painting also represent memories, the fragments carried forward and the fragments left behind. With each footstep, we accompany Ahmad in his choosing of which memories to discard and which to hold on to. In conclusion, all three artists and in this iteration of the Srinagar Biennale Kochi frame their gaze upon the valley and transport the viewer along with them through a shared sensorial experience. No one places blame on who perpetrates the violence. We do not know the culprit. These artists reverse engineer the Pashmina shawl to, to raw sheepskins, or they uncover what lingers in the forest embedded among the brush. So instead of us gazing onto Kashmir, whether through film or in handicraft stores, they offer us their reality. There's no catalog to create an official archive of the Srinagar Biennale. This rhizomatic Biennale resists its vision of Kashmir being packaged for consumption. Instead, we must wait to see where and how it surfaces next. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, our next speaker is Sadi Almamun, who for the Taka Art audience needs little to none introduction, but I think for the rest of us who are not from here, I will say it. Uh, Dali is an artist, uh, is a Bangladeshi artist and art educator based in Chittagong. 
His drawings, paintings, kinetic sculptures, and installation explores issues of knowledge, history, and identity. Uh, Mamun often constructs complex, melodramatic experiences that are allegorical in effect, and often cast new light on the understanding of the memory in his homeland. Uh, Mamun has been in many, many, many exhibitions, which for the benefit of time, I will not list. And in, uh, his work has, is also uh, being collected in various um, collections as well. Uh, Mamun himself is the uh, member of the Shamoy group. And we are very, very lucky uh, to have him with us today to actually speak to us about that experience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening. I'm, I'm really, what I, how can I start? I couldn't stand it really. I was not supposed to be persons to be here today. <laughs> I just replaced someone. Anyhow, uh, I'm, I'm the member of Shamoy. I think Shamoy is a part of my body. So it's very difficult to look at your own body. As I'm a member of Shamoy, I also I'm talking to you that it's, it's really, uh, I cannot see the Shamoy really because of the body. And on the other hand, I, if I started from my memory, I think memory is organic component. So memory is also embodied with many other things, desire, dream, aspiration, and so on. So I think you can see that there is a little presentation. I have, uh, I just, luckily I got it. <laughs> Anyhow, it's, it would be better for me to, if somebody asks me the questions, because I I could not be a, a dictator to speak one way. Um, I better, I love to speak, uh, I think, if someone asks me some questions, then it will help me to tell something. Uh, 1971 is a very important for us, you know, because we liberated in 1971. And the, our generation was constructed in such a reality, which the reality was violence. So we are really uh, looking at the reality and history, which is totally, uh, this one? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think this image is uh, tell you a lot. Uh, this is the image of 1971. Uh, the most important thing for us that the planned killing of the intellectuals, the independence war of 1971. You know about, I think you, all of you know about the, our history and subcontinent history. In 1971, in, the Pakistan, in, in 1947, the, the subcontinent was divided into Pakistan and India, which is based on two nation theory. I think 1971 was a really undo that theory. But after, after 1975, there is another killing that 15 August, the our nation of the father of the nation and Bangabandhu was killed. Uh, this is the collage of the headlines of the newspaper in that time. I think these political circumstances and the cultural context for which I think Shamoy was created. Uh, the political scenario was that after the killing of Sheikh Mojib, we are just beginning our study we all are students in that time in the in the art colleges. So we found that that is such a kind of reality. It, it makes us sick, and our art practice was very different, which is very much uh, intoxicated with modernism. And anyhow, the, it was mostly abstract painting by abstract art. Uh, I think the after nineteen after Second World War. The, even the capital of culture was shifted to America. The American abstract expressionism is uh, highly influenced globally. 
it comes into Bangladesh, also it comes into subcontinent. The, the, the abstract expressionism about abstract art, abstract notion is not came alone. It came with Coca-Cola and blue jeans and rock and roll. So uh, we see, if you look at this uh, film in the 60s, you can see the, how rock and roll was influenced to that film. So the, the way we were constructed and then we could not agree with this whole reality. So we thought that what we can do. On the other hand, that we also not fond of very much the social realism of socialist country. So we have to consider our own tradition. We look at the past, but we are not even uh, agree with the Hevelian idea. You know, the Hevel who was founder of uh, one of the principal uh, who tried to change, according to his own understanding, the Kolkata art pedagogy and uh, curriculum. But we, we understand that it is also not the right path for us. So we try to look at our own reality and also look back to our own tradition, the spirit of tradition. Not We are not fond of the, only for the appearance of the tradition. So the way we try to look at that, and, and, and the Shama is a kind of a translation, it's time, but time is related with the past, present, future. Time is metaphor to us, and time never die. Time is always on move. So I think if you can read it, it, it would be better for me to think, because I don't have any paper to read out. <laughs> so please, you should read it. And uh, better I can read in the last para, in such a realism of the social, political, cultural, and creative scenario, a few like-minded contemporaries, young students were instigated to form a group to express their own experiences, consciousness, and the con contemplation and understanding. Shall I move? So this is, I think, just this image is, is our art scenario, which we don't agree with this surface. That's the, our beginning. It is a kind of resistance also. It is not only the resistance of the political scenario, it's also resistance of the cultural and the visual art scene. This was actually all the references from the, that time what practicing in the mainstream art. And this is all images from the Art Institute of Dhaka. Uh, uh, I think uh, this is also very important that how we constructed the society, politics, culture, and the context. Context is important. I think I, I can tell you some word. We are, our, our friends, most of the friends are involved with the interdisciplinary practice. They are involved with the theater, film, literature. Even some people, some of the members uh, engage with the little magazine also. Uh, like I can tell you there's some names, like theater, like even the breast also, but breast also influences us. As well as the local theater, Jatra, and even the uh, local group theater, they also uh, are, I think, important to us because the way they also try to go beyond the um, proscenium theater, which is belong to the West. They're trying to incorporate the local tradition into the stage also, so like Dhaka theater. They're trying hard to do something. I mean, Selivaldim is one of the most important theater activists. In the other hand, the fame of Riti Ghatak, he's also influenced us very much because you know that Riti Ghatak is one of the great example of that. Even the journal, like third text from London, Rashidarin, and the arts and idea, ideas from Delhi. Uh, even Ashish Rajadiko, I, 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 I remember the time that I wrote one, uh, I read one article by Ashish Rajadiko written to the epic on Riti Ghatak. So it, it is the way we really constructed our mind uh, the, the way we are, we became and we are. And also, uh, this is the image of Shamoy group we started. And, and I also mentioned one thing that Shamoy actually formally started their exhibitions, not from the capital, not from the Dhaka, from the Chittagong. That's also our mindset, that we don't uh, like to centralize our practices. We like to try to uh, our practices spread to the other periphery. 
So even uh, that's one of the great example of that, that we started from Chittagong. And I think this image is not only the document, these images, if you look at the, in, in, the, in the terms of anthropological aspect, you can see the, our dress, our gesture, our body language, everything is related to the, our mindset. And only the one woman artist into the train, this is very interesting. Is it, she's an insider. She's into the interior space. We're always standing in the outside. So maybe this also reflects the society. But right now, we all are in our landscape. It is at the campus of Dhaka Art Institute right now. This is also Dhaka Art College. They are all are not the member of Shuma. There are a lot of our friends also with us. We... <laughs> This graphics done by my one of the, my fellow students. Uh, I'm not a, I'm not expert on computer. My my fellow students, ex students, he he made it for me. <laughs> so I think uh, do you think that I can read out the, the founding of Shamoy initiated the process of the beginning through the exhibition titled Art Exhibition of Nine Young Artists in Bangla, Noyjan Torunir Chitra Pradesh Shilpakala Pradesh. Held in Shilpakala Academy of Chittagong on 1st May. 1st May, you know, is a, is a, is a different day. So it, you, it is also related to the, our political alignment in 1983. And the letter with the exhibition arranged in the Dhaka Art College Gallery, through this exhibition, the representative characteristic of Shamoy could be well identified. And particularly from the brief statements of the participant Printed in the catalog. It is true that we also started to, today is everybody known that art statement should be there, but we started even write artist statement in our catalog also. Exhibition was again the prevalent art scenario of the time and the, could be the clearly realized. But this, this is very interesting photograph. I'm with, I'm with only with the jeans band. And it is really in Chiragong. This is not a gallery. It was auditorium. We have to transform that auditorium into the gallery. So you can understand what is the condition of art practice in our country. Even the second city like Chiragong, there is no art gallery in that time. So we have to work ourselves. We have to build out everything. We have to frame our canvas. We have to even made our gallery space. Even sometimes we have to create our light design also. This is the front and last page of the catalog. We don't have money. So it's very simple, very black and white. Very, I think very simple way we try to create our catalog. This is the inside of the catalog. We were the student of even the undergraduate student at that time. This is the first show of Shamoy. So you can, if you uh, think about the, our context, in that time that art exhibition poster had made with the photograph. The, and this photograph is very much related to the local subaltern culture. And the left, as you should be, in the right side is my work. And you know that that's the military time. That's we are under martial law. So you know the what is suppressed time we have to pass. And it's also interesting that we not only do the painting or other things. We also include photography. The Ali Mushad not only was basically. He was a student of painting, but he did photography, even the photo etching. The, the, in the left images is the reflection of the photo etching. And the right side is the Lara Begum Jolly. She's trying to do something in from that time, to, which is related to the feminine condition. This is one of our friends, Saidul Abjuis, who uh, studied in printmaking. And this is Shishir Bhattacharya. 
this is Habibur Rahman, who also studied in Baroda. And the right one, Selim, who has not continued uh, after this exhibition. Uh, this is all of the portrait of Shamoy members. Uh, this is very interesting that uh, one Pakistani, I think it's a Herald Tribune, most probably. They, after uh, one of the journalists came to the Bangladesh Dhaka in that time, and he, uh, he created a cover story on our exhibition. So I, I'm just putting this one because of that uh, big size of paper relief works. Not I don't have any that photographs so due to that cause. I am also introducing that one images. Uh, it is also done by Saidul Abzuiz, who started in printmaking. Uh, this is our statement in our catalog. It's a special issue we're bringing out. Even sometimes we not only just we are uh, limited in our practice, we try to uh, 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 actually build up a consciousness about the practice, about the understanding of art. The art is not simply in a uh, one kind of uh, in mental state or, or one kind of uh, what I can say uh, what I'm sorry to that I could not remember this time that the abstract notion or the or the abstract uh, criteria is not the judge's art only I think paradigm this is not only the one paradigm there are a lot of paradigm could show. I think you can see that the way we are looking to the modernism in that time. The formula of modern art that was borrowed around the early 60s from the West more as fade and without proper critical analysis and is being accepted as a cultural extension became the dominant factor for pure, good, authentic art can also be felt over here. This is another exhibition by Shomoy. It is 1986. So uh, you understand through this, the, the previous one we got one sponsor, was sponsored, but right time, there is a very little sponsor. But even we could not bring out the catalog. This is also another one, it is 1987. Uh, first time we introduced one uh, one of art critic Professor Abul Mansur was written for us. Again, it, it is Abul Mansur views. The modern art from the very start support from ambiguity of aims and objectivity as artists being confined to an ivory tower where far from reality with a saturated vision of macroscopic and hedonistic view that which phases the eye only. The artist slowly got isolated from the people, society, politics, and environment. Their artworks please the eye, please please the eyes, only rather than making people think for conscious of their environment to be explicit. They do not go beyond the pictorial element or became thought provoking. Well, in the majority of the artists are grouping towards such a goal. Shama as a group is an exception. It was written by Abul Mansur. It is another own catalog. It is 1990. The inside of the catalog. And this is the first time we try to collaborate with the Indian artist also. There are some of the, our fellow artists. I think sales, some people, some artists are known to them. So class one this night, most probably she is teaching in JNU right now. They're all our, our contemporaries at that time. Tolit Mitra, she, he was, I think, shifted into theater. He is now practicing theater in Delhi. He is only uh, one of the leading theater practitioners 
in Delhi, in Bengali theater particularly. So do you think that I have to read out all this thing? Oh, please. Please do. Which one? Sorry, I Oh, it, it is. Oh, it is written by me, actually. Uh, I think that last month. <laughs> I, t I told you that. Uh, yeah. I, it is for the. I, I made it for another, oh, another presentation. So today I'm just. Because I was actually hijacked by Diana for this session today. <laughs> actually, maybe I can tell you something. Because uh, our source of inspiration, we, again, we look back to the, our own reality. And not only we are stalking into the, our, own, our own surroundings, also we look to looking at to the global also, the, what happening in, into the globe. I mean, what kind of artworks is happening in the globe? And we try to reconstruct the new kind of narrative painting in that time. So those people are actually a source of our inspiration. I'm, I'm showing all this kind of images of them. Like from India, those people are engaged with the new, new narrative form, Bhivan, Gulam, Sheikh, and, and the Subramaniam, and even the Mehta also, to some extent, and also Gross. On the other hand, even the British pop, even British uh, pop means Alan Jones, um, Arvi Kitas, David Hockney, Peter Black, and the other hand, the American pop also. And, and also the local living tradition, like rickshaw paintings and urban painting. But this is my painting, you can see this uh, showcasing in these exhibitions. And so you can find out the relation between the previous images. So you're asking me the, what about the condition of the women arts? Uh, the previous one is by Dilara. This is by Shishit Bhattacharya. Again, this is one of my works. Another one is Shishit Bhattacharya. It's totally. This is another show. In, in, in there is another gallery in Shipakala Academy. It was Circle Gallery, yeah, the old one. This all are the members. A gender perspective, two were women in our group. After liberation, where I mean after 71, there are two groups also. Those are very close to us. One is Dhaka painters, one is painters group, another one is Dhaka painters. But their thought structures could not assist us to ceaselessly in our artistic expedition. Shall I move? Oh, <laughs> there's also structures, you know. The most of them from Chittagong, uh, Dhaka, and two from Chittagong. And <laughs> the opposition, middle class and political consciousness, humanitarian and progress.
So this is not dead. So I think uh, you can read out it. Uh, I will just read in the last two paragraphs. I think Diana will agree with us. The maybe human aspiration and expectation can never blend with the realm of reality and complete sense. Right? You agree with you, even in your happenings also. To the artist of culturally motivated creative groups, collectives, or even I, I can tell you one thing that when we started that group, group if the collective also has not appeared to, familiar to us. Even we don't have an idea about the collectives. We started as group. But today the collectives is a part of the contemporary practice. It is, I think, uh, the most important part of the contemporary practice. So, but we, we have the same kind of a spirit. So this is the end. And thank you. I can show you these images. It is very recent images. Uh, we also know how to capture selfie. <laughs> so thank you so much. I think it's good. Thank you so much, Daddy. I think it's such a privilege to be sort of able to hear from a physician of practice, uh, as of artistic practice um, of a collective. Um, so now to our uh, last speaker, uh, Dana. Dana Linnergren is a PhD candidate from, the, from CUNY, uh, the City University of New York, where uh, she's almost finishing her <laughs> dissertation. Um, today, D uh, Dana will be speaking to us about um, a group of collectives in Dhaka, in Senegal, that she has been looking at for a number of years now. So over to Dana. Thank you, Michelle. And I'd like to join my fellow panelists in thanking Diana the Samdani family and Dhaka Art Summit for hosting us and for organizing such wonderful programming. And thank you so much to Mahasa for enabling all of us to be here and to share our, uh, our work together. And the remote is here, thank you. For today's panel on collectives, I wish to consider a few intertwined situations that I view as affecting the current reception of and access to African art. One is the transit and dislocation of African art objects. Another, related to this, is the circulation of art market capital. In introducing these topics, I aim to juxtapose them against the work of artist collectives in present-day Dakar, Senegal, to ultimately propose that such groups provide through their modes of production and knowledge dissemination an essential counterpoint to the monetized movement of African art. During the 1970s, oh, it works. Senegal's post-independence political and economic conditions gave rise to an artistic avant-garde that often worked in direct response to what was viewed by some as a misdirected and stifling approach to art making as a nation building initiative. The collective Laboratoire Agit Art, born out of this social and political tension, was founded in 1974 by philosopher artist Issa Sam, filmmaker Jibril Diop Mombeti, painter El Agic, and playwright Yusufa Dion. They shared the goal of creative 
creating politically minded community based projects in pursuit of greater public consciousness and activism regarding contemporary societal concerns. While state supported painters and weavers created durable works for international display and consumption, the laboratoire experimented with temporary installations uh, and performances. Its members reacted to the perceived egoism of the individual artist, which seemed to run counter to prioritization of the greater good of the community at large by reclaiming traditions of collaborative creativity and participation. And while instruction at the École Nationale des Beaux-Arts favored the use of imported Western materials, such as stretched canvas, oil paints, and paintbrushes, the laboratoire group looked to their immediate surroundings for objects and props, preferring the use of natural and repurposed found materials, scrap metal from the streets of Dakar, reused sacks in place of prepared canvas, often marked with tar or tree sap rather than oil paint. In the decades since the laboratoire's founding, the collective has evolved and remains active today, as I will discuss shortly. Meanwhile, current international conversations surrounding African art and heritage serve to emphasize the importance of such collectives for both local artists and larger transnational communities. At the end of November 2018, a report commissioned by French President Emmanuel Macron and generated by two scholars, Benedict Savoy of France and Felwyn Saar of Senegal, called for the permanent return to Africa of all objects sent to France without consent, if requested by the object's countries of origin. Referencing the deep and traumatic history of French colonialism in Africa, the report proposes that such non-consensual transactions pertain to, quote, any objects acquired through inequitable conditions, end quote. Their report, which posits that up to 95% of objects pertaining to African cultural heritage currently reside in museums outside the continent, has invigorated discussions in Africa, Europe, and the US surrounding the circulation and ownership of African art, discussions that lead in turn to questions of visibility and accessibility. In France, the movement and display of African objects has an unsurprisingly thorny history, one that is famously linked to some of the most celebrated works by Picasso, Matisse, Durin, and other canonical heroes of European modernism. It was at Paris's Musée d'Ethnographie du Trocadero, now the Musée de l'Homme, that Picasso viewed the traditional masks that ignited his interest in so-called primitive art and contributed to the realization of his Demoiselle d'Avignon of 1907. Many of these totemic objects are, for now, in the collection of the Musée Quai Renowned for its collection of 70,000 African objects, Paris's Musée Quai is undergoing remarkable changes in the wake of Macron's commissioned investigation into possibilities for restitution. The museum has already pledged to return 26 notable objects to their countries of origin, which has caused some wariness among museum staff. However, Savoy and Saar were careful to clarify that their report is not calling for the emptying out of Western collections, but rather a, quote, rebalancing of the geography of African heritage in the world, to use Benedict Savoy's phrase. Beyond large-scale institutions, prominent private collections in the US and Europe have dislocated works of art from the continent, and the sale of contemporary African art has accelerated markedly within the last 20 years. The recent establishment of, in 2017 of Sotheby's Department of, of Modern and Contemporary African Art attests to this. Perhaps one of the most visible figures within the contemporary African art market is Ellen Atsui, Ghanaian sculptor and installation artist based in Nigeria. His large-scale tapestry-like sculptural hangings, often made from recovered liquor cap bottle caps sourced from local surroundings, have recently fetched six and seven figures at sale. Understandably, the acquisition of Anatsui's works by institutions including the Met, the British Museum, and the Centre Pompidou has only served to drive up these numbers. The work of Congolese artist Bodis Isek Kingeles represents rather different conditions that nevertheless relate to visibility within the contemporary market. A recent retrospective exhibition of Kingeles' pieces at New York's Museum of Modern Art 
on view from May 2018 until January 2019, showcased the artist's whimsical approach to architectural design and city planning. Frequently, not unlike Anatsui's bottle caps, Kingles uses colored futuristic materials to create cityscapes, uh, such as branded products pack of, like packaging and soda cans. These act as a gesture of local and global healing in the face of various postmodern conditions such as rampant capitalism, the AIDS crisis, and large-scale terrorism, and offer a utopian vision for a more sustainable and egalitarian way of living. Significantly, the exhibition represents the first retrospective of Kingalese's work in the US and MoMA's first retrospective devoted to a black African artist. It is also worth noting that MoMA issued a special thanks to the Jean Pigazzi collection from which the majority of the works on display were lent. What this means for the late artist is that while he enjoyed the support of a devoted patron during his lifetime, the directional flow of his oeuvre is largely one of export and departure. After being absorbed into a private collection, the works are free to circulate only at the collector's discretion. This, of course, returns us to points raised in the context of Saar and Savoy's restitution report. As noted by Macron himself, works of African culture, quote, must be showcased in Paris but also in Dakar, in Lagos, in Cotonou. Alongside this market activity and proposals for restitution, we can see the per persistence of non-commercial art enterprises in Africa devoted to engagement with art and its histories through alternate methods. Collectives like the Laboratoire, through their creative methods of knowledge sharing and creation, expose contemporary practices in Africa, such as performance, ephemeral art and public art that, by their nature, frequently resist collection or commercialization and promote communal forms of curatorial and artistic practice. As experienced during the 2018 installment of Dakart, the Laboratoire, in its contemporary iteration, often pays homage to the legacy of previous generations of artists, Issa Sam in particular in this case, while simultaneously crafting innovative forms of visual expression and utilizing abandoned spaces of Dakar. These artistic strategies and motivations exist in various forms. The artist known as Mudboy, founder of the Yatal Art Collective, proposes that the democratization of art and its spaces of exposition and access are of crucial importance within the Dakar community. Through interventions and installations, Mudboy's group eschews or inverts the typical Western model of an exhibition space a sterile white cube to which access is granted uh, to supposedly particular status members and specific sartorial choices. Uh, that is to say that Modboy believes that the white cube uh, supposes that the, the viewer should be wearing a tie, whereas the uh, alternative spaces that he uses are a come as you are uh, space of exhibition. These places perforate the boundaries between art and everyday life, bestowing new purpose and vitality into abandoned or underused structures. A related sensibility can be found within and around art centers like Espas Medina and Ker Chosan, in which the membranes between artistic creativity, lived experience, and public space are purposefully permeable. At Espas Medina, a location whose connection to the Laboratoire Agit Art stretches back to the 1960s, one can find art and utilitarian items created using, uh, ah, excuse me, created from transformed or repurposed objects within a communal environment. As a space in which ideas, knowledge, and creative expression are shared and disseminated into the surrounding streets, Espas Medina is a kind of heterotopia, an alternate place that reflects palpable ties to Dakar's unique art history, while presently serving as an artistic hub and creative incubator whose impact radiates outward to transform the surrounding areas. At Ker Chosan, sustainable and low-tech features such as solar panels and the Frigo du Désert, a natural refrigeration device, add an environmentally friendly element to the art center's mission to support and promote digital art and multimedia projects alongside analog techniques and traditional influences. Other initiatives include the nearby Jardin Jet d'eau, 
a communal project to stabilize and beautify the public space shared among the surrounding apartments, and the École de Commun, a series of discussions, proposals, and experiments aimed at analyzing and contributing to communal well-being through sustainable collaborative living and societal engagement. In response to this changing city, visual artist Pinyang leads a, coll a collective collaborative group in, among other projects, composing meticulously detailed architectural maquettes to create a kind of sculptural archive for areas of Dakar that are at risk for disappearing. Abutting the new construction of contemporary high-rise buildings, such juxtaposition creates imbalanced perspectives on wealth and how we understand its highly subjective and fluctuating nature. By pointing to collaborative modes of living within such areas, for example, the potential for social contact through the process of obtaining potable drinking water, the group's sensibility highlights communal ties and a closeness to nature that appear to be decreasing amid so-called so modernization and urbanization, resulting in the potential for less intimate ways of living and being. While these collectives do not usurp the place of commercial art galleries in Dakar and elsewhere, they provide platforms from which artists may largely evade market participation and interrogate the rather paradoxical entanglements between capitalist power structures and artistic production. This presentation in no way exhausts the many relevant conditions of contemporary African art and its production, circulation, and monetization. Furthermore, it is important to acknowledge that many of the patterns and challenges discussed are linked to significant material and financial imbalances that persist between the global north and south. However, perhaps what we may take away from these examples is that in Dakar, a creative ethos of cooperation and self-determination seems to persist nevertheless, and by all evidence, will continue to expand. Thank you. I'll just ask sort of one um, general question and then actually open it up for um, discussion. Um, and I actually want to ask a question about um, literature. Um, because, um, Sally, you mentioned that the Shomar group was actually in very, very close uh, conversation with people in film and in theater, in literature as well. And I just want to also hear from the other panelists to see that if sort of the case study that we've looked at also share this um, sort of similarity. And in that case, uh, what were the things that the, 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 the artists that you're researching into, what were they reading or what films were they watching? And sort of how did the other um, artistic practice beyond the visual arts inform their being together as um, a collective? I suppose I'll start. Um, what's interesting about this question, uh, which perhaps I'll answer it by referencing uh, and, and Issa Sam in particular, uh, is that on the one hand, while the group was actively trying to reclaim uh, a certain kind of cooperative and collaborative mode of working, which in itself harkened back to local traditions of uh, community building, uh, those artists in the 60s and 70s were also being influenced by writings by Antonin Artaud, for example, and um, taking cues from certain French uh, produced notions of performance and um, destabilizing what the, a performance could be. Um, so in case of Lahore Art Circle, they definitely had a very strong connection with the literary circle. I mentioned it like in a cursory way. Um, but the painters themselves were writing, like Shakir Ali was a writer, like, you know, he had uh, written many articles. Shamza um, wrote seven novels, many short stories. Um, so um, also the fact that, you know, they were meeting at this place, which I mentioned, Park Tea House, and I emphasize that. Um, that was a place where uh, artists and writers and, you know, all the intelligentsia of Lahore was like, you know, coming. So they had a very strong connection. And Shakir coming from outside, um, he was reading Rilke um, that we know. And, you know, um, the other ones were getting, um, you know, um, uh, 
I would say, like guidance from Shakir what to read, because we know in case of Zahurul Ikhlaq, the one of the contemporary artists from Pakistan, um, he used to say that he was actually literally guided by Shakir what to read and um, who to study. So I don't remember anything on top of my head, but like, you know, most of it was like, you know, reading the Rilke, reading Rilke, um, another one I'm just skipping was something that he was very passionate about. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I told in my presentations also that our group, most of our group members, most of them are engaged with the theater and literature also, like Little Magazine. Even some of the members, like Lala Rukselem, she was edited one journal, it is, it is called Art. Um, and also, I will say, involved with another journal, it is in Bangla, it's called Prashango. Uh, and also, I'm involved with the many other little makers in France. Most of the, I'm just doing cover design. Also, I have some very good friendship with one of the famous writers, it, uh, uh, Akhtar Jamal Elias. And also, other friends, my contemporary friends, like Shahjat Chori, who has written also poet and journalist. They also bringing out one little magazine, it's called Gandhi. This is also. Uh, you can see in the Shamai representations. On the other hand, we all love to watch film, like we love Godar, we like Truffaut, we like Fellini, and eventually we like Ritik, Shatjit, in the from the Japan, we like Ozo and Kurosawa, and also from Africa, we like Osman Semen, many others. And so in that way, really, it helps us to, to create our own mindset, our perception. On the other hand, we also found up Latin American literature, like Marquez. Uh, even even one of the, my painting title was borrowed from uh, Marquez writing from that were told. Uh, so the, the way really we are interested, even theater. I was used to do so many uh, stage design. Even I was one of the founder member of one theater group in Chittagong. So the, in a way, we have an interdisciplinary practice. Um, at least from what I what I know about the artists who participated in the Srinagar, Srinagar Biennale Kochi, uh, there was such an age range that it wasn't uh, in the sense of your collectives where I, I think that there was a shared generation. Um, so I didn't quite encounter or don't know enough myself about uh, text or um, kind of cultural influences. Because I think uh, Vera Moon, she was born in the 50s or 60s. And then the rest, 80s, uh, 89, I think is the Or actually, in the 90s is the youngest. Um, I'm, I think I'm just going to open this up for uh, questions or comments. So if uh, anyone has any burning questions, so now is the time. If not, I can still go on. Um, thank you. Uh, this was really lovely hearing all your presentations. I was just wondering if <clears throat> all the groups uh, or collectives had, uh, I noticed that some of them had very specific logos, you know, the Lahorat circle seemed to have the uh, dancing girl, um, the Srinagar Biennale at least has the, the, the nodes, you know, the rhizomatic sort of thing as their logo. The Shamoy group, I think, used a very specific typeface to write. So can you say a little bit about why that, or anything about that design perhaps, or, or anything? Um, or, I mean, for instance, for Samina more specifically, I guess that my question would be, what, why did the Indus Valley civilization or what specific thing did it mean for the Lahorat circle who were such a modernist group, but their logo was of the, the dancing girl? So um, in my larger expansion of work, I address that. So a couple of things um, to read. So one is that the logo is of the dancing girl of Indus Valley. Um, and it is actually, if you look at the logo, it's actually reversed. 
So um, it can be read in many ways. One is the claim to that tradition, like, you know, um, the idea. And then also, the re I mean, if we look at nowadays the scholarship, we claim the abstract art as like, you know, going back to primitive art. So, I mean, also that's very modernist if you look at the image of it. So that itself, I mean, regardless of what time period it belonged. But I think the reversal of it was had meaning because it could be read like, you know, we have put the past behind but still own it, moving forward with that. So, I mean, different various ways to read it. Um, yeah, so as you mentioned, the um, symbol for the Srinagar Biennale is uh, kind of the rhizomatic form. And um, that comes from uh, Deleuze and Guattari's theory of you know, multiple starts and no zero hierarchy. And that's pretty much how they operate, where anybody can take up and curate a node anywhere um, as curator and incorporate any number of, of artists. And so I guess that symbol kind of captures um, the essence of their format and how they travel globally. Yeah, I think uh, the, uh, our, our the, most of the design is the representation of our understanding. What we understand about even, even the graphics, I mean, everything is a kind of representations. So somehow if you, somebody is looking to that and, and really study that in, in, in terms of what is, how it connected with our culture and our time, then it, I think it, of course it, it is understandable. Anybody want to say anything? Hello, hello. Uh, thanks for the wonderful presentation all of you have done. So my question is to the uh, Samina. Actually, Samina, there is a, a it's a Lahore art circle, na? So just be, just uh, uh, from my investigation, I have found that in Dhaka also there is an art, uh, art Dhaka art group, and before that there is a Calcutta art group, and far <laughs> before there is a London art group. So the, the, is there have any you know? I mean, connections between all these groups and all of them. But just for my, from my curiosity, I just want to know, yes. Uh, Thank you. So I think um, when I started doing the research, the way I came across was looking at Bombay progressives. Um, and then I was trying to see like, you know, what is happening? This was during my coursework in graduate school. And I was looking at like what's happening in Pakistan at the, that time when, you know, India has this Bombay progressive, which was formed in 1947, 14th August, that, date is given precisely in some one, by one of the scholars. Um, what I have argued for my own research is that, you know, Lahore Art Circle was modeled after Bombay Progressive, and there were practical reasons for that. One was that, you know, Sayyid Ali Imam being brother of Sayyid Hedda Raza, like, you know, it is impossible that, you know, they, he didn't know about this. Like, you know, they were at the same time in the same city. Um, also, the fact that Sheikh Saftar Ali, in my presentation, I briefly mentioned that he also had all formed another group which was called as Muslim Art Sketch um, Group, which was also, um, it, this is a time when uh, Sheikh Saftar Ali is working for Bombay Talkies and M.F. Hussain is also around. I mean, they're all doing the cinema set paintings and all of that. So I definitely see like, you know, um, like one modeled being after the other, but I'm not so sure I don't have that specific research done, like, you know, if they really had those kind of concrete connections, if you're asking for that. Thank you all very, you know, wonderful and very informative presentations. Uh, I had a question for, um, for, the, for the Srinagar, um, which is that, you know, the, the question of rhizomatic is, of course, uh, I mean, it's a very egalitarian and kind of, you know, multi, multi, you know focusing on multiplicity and non-hierarchy and so on. But, you know, what, so I'm wondering who's the theorist or ideologue or, you know, uh, you know, uh, who's, who's developed this concept and what happens in, let's say, next year if a curator from, you know, Canada comes and puts a Swiss and an Argentinian artist and calls it Srinagar Biennial. I mean, where does, where is Kashmir and, you know, like, what, where is, where's the limits of the rhizome, rhizome basically, right? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, I think it's, it's, um, well, Saeed Mustab, Mustab, <laughs> Saeed, Mushtabi Rizvi started it, um, who's Kashmiri. And 
there has yet to be, from what I've discovered, a non-Kashmiri, whether in Kashmir or in the diaspora as a curator. There have been artists who are non-Kashmiri participating, but always like at the um, other site or where they surfaced as, an, as a node physically or virtually, as in we saw between Switzerland and Sweden. But yeah, it does bring a, an interesting question of uh, what are the parameters and you know, how egalitarian is it? Um, it would be interesting what would happen if there was, say, an Indian curator or a Pakistani curator, um, and if, if, if that would be permitted. Uh, permitted, yeah, that's true. Like, who is who is the the leader there? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it would that would be the ultimate test. So maybe that needs to happen. <laughs> I mean, I, exactly, right? Yeah, like if the, if a government entity took it up as well. Oh yeah. I think um, a lot of the influence of rhizomatic stuff comes from Inda Salim, a New Delhi-based artist from Kashmir, and he's one of the co-founders of the Biennale with Mushtaba Rizvi and Veera Munshi also. So um, Inda Salim has had a... Um, like, he's been preoccupied with rhizomatic kind of discourse for a few decades, and, um, yeah, that's how that influence came in. Um. Following up on that, though, I was wondering, since you know we have on on the panel um, this wonderful assortment of people who are talking about collectives from different periods, from the 50s, from the 80s and 90s, and then more recently, and um, out, outside, you know, we're hearing the collectives kind of the collective action, right? And um, I think Melissa, your talk already kind of hints at the kind of um, evolution of collectives and maybe the different forms that collectives take now, as opposed to you know something that which is a group of friends or a group that kind of organized around a place. And there's a certain rootedness or um, togetherness in the sense of collective, whereas I think you're talking about a very different kind. And I was wondering if maybe the other panelists have something to say about you know collective art groups or art collectives that they're seeing today, and if they have any comments they'd like to make. I must say, um, I uh, moderated this panel this morning, Combating Islamophobia Through Art, and I had the pleasure of speaking to the collectives. Eleven, some of the representatives are sitting here. I'm actually quite surprised, like, seeing the collectives, the way they're working in a very positive sense and, you know, being there to support each other. I don't see that the part of the world where I live. It's like a very cutthroat art scene, like, you know, people don't share work, they don't want to give anybody a feedback, and you know, they don't even share their work. So I think I'm not so very sure how other people, but like, you know, speaking to um, Noor is sitting here uh, from 11, um, it was very impressive to see like how they their collective works, like, you know, in terms of like uh, even mentorship, that's like, you know, what I see in, in what my research from Lahore Art Circle is like, you know, Shakir Ali becomes that father figure, that teacher that really guides and, you know, whole hand and really guide them through. I'm not, um, I don't see that, like, so for instance, like, if you ask me, in, I can only speak in terms of, like, you know, Pakistan art scene, we don't have any collective right now, and I don't think I'm going to be opposed on that. I don't see any collective there right now. So what I'm seeing here is a wonderful display of, like, you know, what could a collective do is, like, you know, really being productive and supportive and, you know, become that platform that people can, you know, um, show their work and have that assurance that, you know, what they're doing is like, you know, means something and it's important. For me, I think collective is very important today. Uh, from my understanding, and personally, I understand that modernism actually separated art from the society. So through the collectives, uh, we can again, uh, I think, re, uh, reconnection with the society. Because Art is part of the life. So it are the, I think the modernism and capitalism making art is an object. And it is uh, more or less, it is into the, who's forced into the market. That can, I think, very, if, if, if the homo sapien needs to go forward, I think through the collectives can possible to make art into the society back again. That's my understanding. So maybe I hope that collectives will do that. But if the collective is doing work like NGO, uh, they're making projects and having fun, 
In that case, I'm critical about collectives. Thank you, Dali Bhai, for bringing up the subject. So um, in terms of uh, the collective scene in Bangladesh now, as you can see, we have a lot of collective growing maybe uh, since 2010, uh, 2010 and 11. Uh, and you mentioned something about the NGO. So what is your view on the present collective scene and how much you think the NGO practice is coming in and how much uh, it is actually making a de uh, development in the practice or the interaction in a different uh, level? No, I'm not actually talking about that. I'm talking about that the, what is the necessity of the collectives? Collectives, of course, it's a necessity because in my understanding, my experience is that modernism is really separated art from the society. Uh, it is showcasing into the uh, white cube right now, you know. Still, we are carrying that legacy. But in the other hand, the contemporary art practice is very much related with the collective effort. Collective is a part of the contemporary practice. It is kind of a trend now. But I'm, again, I'm looking that so many collectives are looking for fund looking for they're making actual project that's my questions actually i'm not generalize everybody there are a lot of collectives are really they're believing in it not means that i'm generalizing or take but i want to be careful about that that's my intention that's my inquiry that i'm wondering about that and actually i have a question for samina why I, I'm curious to hear you talk a bit more about what the disappearance of the collective from present day Lahore. Do you have any theories on why or, or perhaps is it no longer needed? I want to go back home. <laughs> um, I think it was a, one thing that I can say is like, you know, the formation of Lahore Circle Art Circle happened at a time when, you know, Pakistan had just been established and there was really a need for the people, like minded people come together and like, you know, really break away from what was a very strong hold on ready with the prevalent uh, condition. So I mentioned like Abdurrahman Chuktai, who was working there, very monumental figure. And then Anna Malka, on the other hand, was very monumental, like, you know, socialist realism, uh, social realism was her, you know, uh, genre or like her um, forte for like the painting. I think now the time has changed. I think people don't need that kind of like, you know, uh, assurance. It's the art market that really gives them the assurance and I think that is enough for them to keep going in. I think maybe in the younger generation, there might be like, you know, um, new students coming up, maybe do it, but I have not seen that trend like coming back in here. Uh, I mean, that's exactly what you said. Yeah, in Bangladesh, I think she's one of the member of collective who is asking questions to me. And that's also true. There's a lot of collectives in Bangladesh right now. So I'm just uh, thinking about that, uh, why? Because there are a lot of reason to make, build up collectives, not necessarily the one causes for the collectives. But my intention is that what is important for the collectives eh, in, in terms of uh, uh, substance, in terms of uh, intention and philosophical points. The, if, if just we are united for our own existence uh, for the, for in terms of money and other things, or really we believe it? That's the, my question. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't want to hurt anybody. I'm, I'm truly, I'm just uh, raising these questions. Even it is asking myself also. Can I just say one, one last thing? So that your question was like, you know, I think the emphasis nowadays is more on individualism. Like, you know, because I said like art market dictates it and like, you know, it's not about like, you know, how we collectively think. So maybe that's also one of There's another question. If so. so I think the last discussion pointed out to the kind of un geographic unevenness in terms of the density of collectives and the, perhaps the need, you know, why collectives are arising in certain places more so than others. And uh, uh, that might be worth, you know, kind of in a sense uh, uh, reflecting on more. Right? Uh, that why in, in a 
you know, so I mean, if in a place like Pakistan, it, there are not as many collectives working today as there are in in Bangladesh or you know, or uh, or or Senegal or in other places. Um, so one may have to look at. I mean, the art market plays a role, but I think art school training and pedagogy and the way artists become artists, you know, kind of plays a role. And uh, and certainly other, uh, you know, kind of. Uh, I think both intellectual uh, factors and the relation of. Uh, Artists, the way they perceive themselves in relation to society also plays a role in terms of how they envision their, their horizon of, uh, of practice, whether it's individual or collective, perhaps. Yeah. Any other questions? If not, um, please join me with a round of applause for all of our panelists on the stage. And thank you to you all for sticking it through. Here are another collective of bodies. We had 22 hours together. And uh, I wish you all a very good evening. Thank you for coming.